For some reason this week, I was thinking of the power that certain men, and some women too, these days, the power that certain men and women hold over us, the citizens of the world. Just a handful of leaders around the globe have the ability to enhance or disrupt the lives of the rest of us. I stumbled onto a web page where all of the leaders of the world are listed alphabetically by nation. From Afghanistan to Zimbabwe, they are all there, 197 of them. The list changes frequently, but someone somewhere keeps it updated. It occurred to me that each of these 197 world leaders have the power to bless or to curse their own people. By the words they speak and the actions they take, their countrymen may be helped, hindered, or even harmed. Further, because nations interact, these 197 world leaders have the ability to disrupt the lives of not only their own people, but all the rest of us. A leader in some country whose name I can't even pronounce may say something stupid that starts a war. After all, wars begin with words. In America, right at this moment, our leader is President Joe Biden. He certainly has the ability to impact the lives of U.S. citizens with the things he says. And his word also carries much weight on the world stage. And then over there in faraway Russia, their president, Vladimir Putin, also has the ability to disrupt the lives of American citizens. Based upon his decisions, his comments, and subsequent actions, our nation is potentially impacted. And on the other side of the world is the president of the People's Republic of China, Xi Jinping. Again, he's a powerful man whose words and actions may impact our lives here in the good old USA. And a nation needn't be large and powerful or even important for its leader to potentially threaten our security. Kim Jong-un of North Korea is a major pain in everyone's backside with his posturing and efforts to develop nuclear weapons. The things that man says are often headline news. There's an old saying that goes something like this, where the word of a king is, there is power. Imagine, with just a word from the lips of any one of these powerful world leaders, your life and my life could easily be disrupted, turned upside down, and torn apart. As I said, wars begin with words. But hold on a minute. Let's consider the power of these world leaders in comparison to another well-known ruler. We needn't guess as to the power of the word when this one speaks, for the scripture is clear. Jesus is the Word of God. The heavens were made by the Word of the Lord, and all the stars by the breath of His mouth. Out of nothingness, the glorious creation we see in the night sky leaped into existence at the Word of the Lord. He simply spoke. The heavens were made by God's Word. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, When the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, Scripture says, There was nothing but the solemn voice of God. Then God said, He said, Let there be light, and light was. Let's, Let's see, see Joe, Joe Biden, Biden or Vladimir Putin, Putin do that. Do that. God's word was sufficient all by himself to build the universe. The pillars of heaven stand because God did this one thing. He spoke. Consider for a moment the power of God's word. From the moment God first spoke the universe into existence, it has gone on all these many eons. It's immense, and it has continued pretty much without change from the beginning to this very day. And the word that God spoke, that word which once created, the Bible tells us, will also one day destroy. John was given an understanding about these things. He wrote about the coming destruction of heaven and earth. He said it simply, it will pass away. We understand that term, pass away, because that's what we say when a loved one dies. We say he or she passed away. Read what John declared in the book called Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. 
There's that phrase, passed away. Then the one seated on the throne said, Look, I'm making all things new. Yes, this present universe of ours, the first heaven and the first earth, will one day pass away. It will come to its demise in the same way it began, by the word of God. And one day a new heaven and a new earth will be created. And look who's the one doing the creating. The one seated on the throne, God's only son. He declares, look, I am making all things new. So God's word created the first heaven and the earth. And God's word will one day make a new heaven and earth. But that's still a long way off, far, far in the future from our perspective. So much happens between then and now. But pause to think a moment about the day our present universe was created. The Bible provides much detail about what happened that day. The Holy Spirit of God was there, Genesis tells us, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And the Word was there, of course. It was spoken by God. Then God said, the Bible says. And of course, God was there. Jesus taught us to think of him as our Father who art in heaven. So God the Father was there, and God the Holy Spirit was there, and the Word of God was present also. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, not even one thing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and life was the light of mankind. So, not even one thing came into existence without the Word. Life itself was in him. He was the light of mankind. All things came into being through him. Now, consider this. The words one speak are the very essence of who we are. You see, others know you largely based upon the things you say and then do. What you say to others is what they know about you. And if you say you will do something and then do it, well, others know that your word can be trusted and you can be trusted. And that's how we know God too, based largely upon the things he has said The very words God spoke are recorded in our Bibles. And when he acts upon the many promises you find there, well, we know that his word is trustworthy and that he is trustworthy. You see, God's word is the very essence of who he is. Now stop a moment and think of God's word in a different way. This is a bit of a mind bender, so you have to pause a moment just to think it through. Think of God's word taking on flesh and bone. It sort of morphs into the form of a human being. Scripture tells us clearly that the word of God became a man. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Consider, my friends, what power is concentrated in the word of God that became flesh and bone and dwelt among us. The power of Xi Jinping and Kim Jong-un and all the rest of them put together pale in comparison to the power of God's word. Now is a season of Christmas time, and so all around the world, people are preparing to celebrate the birth of Jesus. He is the word that became flesh. Last week, we started a new study in Ezekiel. So today, let's investigate how the Lord used his word to address the misdeeds of the leaders of his day. They too were powerful men and they were acting in their own self-interests instead of doing what was right for their citizens. Time and again, God gave Ezekiel a word that he was to speak. In chapter 11, Ezekiel wrote, The Spirit then lifted me up and brought me to the eastern gate of the Lord's house which faces east, and at the gate's entrance were twenty-five men. Among them I saw Jazaniah, son of Azur, and Pelatiah, son of Benaiah, leaders of the people. The Lord said to me, Son of man, these are the men who plan evil and give wicked advice in this city. They are saying, Isn't the time near to build houses? The city is the pot, and we are the meat. Therefore prophesy against them, Prophesy, son of man. Ezekiel was God's messenger. 
The proper role of any prophet, priest, or preacher of God's word is to deliver God's message as clear as possible and without embellishment. God told Ezekiel, prophesy, son of man. In other words, preach it, brother. Anytime you hear a man who claims to speak for God who is preaching something other than the word of God, my friend, you need to turn that one off. If God's truth is not being preached, stand up and walk out. Repeatedly, Ezekiel says, the Lord said to me. Do you see how the Bible prints that word, Lord? When the word Lord is printed in all caps, that indicates that in the original Hebrew text, you will find the word Yahweh. That's God's name. It's also sometimes written Yahweh, and at times it's transliterated into the English word Jehovah. So, as not to overuse God's name, since the days of King James when the Bible was first translated into English, you'll find the word often translated the Lord with all capital letters. When the word Lord occurs in lowercase letters, the translator is indicating to us that the Hebrew word Adonai is found in the original text. Adonai means sovereign one. It's the supreme title given to God in the Old Testament. My point is that Ezekiel was being very clear about who was directing him to speak. Yahweh, that is, the Lord, in all capital letters. God himself spoke to Ezekiel and told him what to say. He directed him to address these evil men who were abusing their power in Jerusalem. He said, these are the men who plan evil and give wicked advice in the city. Rather than encouraging the people to repent and seek God, these evil men were giving the wrong advice. They were leaders who the general population of Israel blindly followed. The people weren't questioning their decisions or investigating their motives. As I said earlier, a handful of leaders around the world have the ability to either enhance or disrupt the lives of all the rest of us. If we follow them without questioning their decisions and investigating their motives, we're behaving just as the Israelites did. And when we do that, we place ourselves in jeopardy. Isn't it time to build houses, these leaders asked? In other words, aren't these the best of times? No, it wasn't the time to build houses and it wasn't the best of times. God's judgment was upon Israel. The city is the pot and we are the meat, they proclaimed. They believed the Israelites were the choice morsels of meat among mankind and were protected by the pot in which they lived, namely the city of Jerusalem. How do Americans see themselves? In other words, the Israelite leaders were saying, all is right in the world, things are looking up, the best is yet to come, happy days are here again. But all that was nonsense. God told his prophet Ezekiel, prophesy against them, prophesy, son of man. The message God gave to Ezekiel was an urgent one. You see, a century earlier, in 722 BC, Israel was a divided nation. God had given them the promised land, but they did not purge it of idols as God had directed them to. So he sent the Assyrian army against the northern kingdom of Israel and its capital city, Samaria. After a three-year siege, Samaria fell, and the northern kingdom came to an end. The Assyrians scattered the people among the nations. Now, 125 years later, the Babylonians had come against the southern kingdom, called Judah. In Jerusalem, in the heart of Judah, things were gradually growing worse, not better, as their leaders proclaimed. The people had not learned from what happened to their brethren in the northern kingdom. Instead of turning to God, they disobeyed him. They ignored him. They lived their lives as though he did not exist. Consequently, God's judgment came upon them. But in this time of trouble, God sent a prophet. Did any hope remain for the people? Or, or were they just doomed? God declared, yes, hope remained. They had hope, but only if they turned back to God. My friends, we must learn from Ezekiel. In our democracy, our leaders are prone to give us false hope in the form of exaggerated promises just to get elected. They thrive on false promises. But there is a bigger problem in America than our leaders. 
Sadly, many Americans behave as though they don't care what God said. They don't care about God. But does God care about them? You and I know he does. We know how much he loves each and every one of us. So it's up to us to tell our neighbors. We must become Ezekiel's. Some of our neighbors are worshiping false gods. We live in a pluralistic, multicultural society, so that's all right. I'm less concerned about them than those who have forgotten about God altogether. These Americans focus on worldly things, their careers, accumulating money, buying bigger and fancier houses and faster cars. We believers must speak the truth to them as clearly and without apology as Ezekiel spoke to the people of his day. Our message is a simple one. There is a better way to live life. There's no happiness without God. Turn to Jesus now before it's too late. Jesus is literally the world's only hope. The Word of God, the Word made flesh, that one who was born of a virgin so long ago, Jesus understands us, in part because he made us, but also because he is one of us. My friends, he understands you better than you understand yourself. The only hope for any of us is to place our lives in God's hands by believing in his Son. The word of the Lord came to me again, son of man, your own relatives, those who have the right to redeem your property, along with the entire house of Israel, all of them are those to whom the residents of Jerusalem have said this to. You are far from the Lord. This land has been given to us as a possession. Ezekiel declared time and again, the word of the Lord came to me. Please, when you read the phrase like that, never forget who the word of the Lord is. The word is that one we celebrate at Christmas, born of the Virgin Mary in a stable because there was no room for him in the inn. He is the word made flesh who dwelt among us. He is the word who was in the beginning. He is Jesus, the word that was with God and the word that was God. Oh yes, that word. Scripture says that the word came to Ezekiel again. He addressed him as son of man, which you may recall is precisely what Jesus called himself when he walked this earth, the son of man. Those words occur almost a hundred times in the book of Ezekiel in reference to him. It emphasizes his humanity in precisely the same way the son of God wanted to emphasize his humanity when he walked the earth. God told Ezekiel that his word impacted not only Israel, but his own relatives. Your own relatives, those who have the right to redeem your property, he said. Back then, a family member of one who had fallen on hard times had first option to purchase his property, that is, to redeem it. That way, at least, it stayed in the family. Should the one who lost his property ever regain his wealth, he could then buy it back from his family member. That was his right. But Ezekiel was a Levite. His people were given no property. They were priests of Israel. They just weren't doing a great job of it. The people were floundering primarily because they had very poor spiritual guidance. And the problem wasn't just with Ezekiel's tribe, the priesthood. The problem lay, God said, with the entire house of Israel. Only a few Israelites were faithful amongst so many others who behaved as if God did not exist. Sound familiar? (laughs) Think again about America. Think about your neighborhood, your street. When you rise on Sunday morning to attend church, how many of your neighbors are doing the same? When you lock your front door and walk out to your car, Bible in hand, do you see others doing that also? Are they locking up their front doors, rounding up their kids and climbing into their vehicles, and then driving away to attend the church of their choice? When you drive to church Sunday mornings, are the streets as clogged with cars carrying their occupants to their churches as it is weekday mornings when everyone is trying to get to work? Or are the streets more or less empty on Sunday mornings? That's what I thought. You see, Americans today are much like the Israelites of Ezekiel's day. Many have drifted far from the Lord, 
Only a few faithfully worship the Lord. Only a few serve the one true living God. As much as I love America, God help us. Freedom is a good thing. Many have fought and died to preserve it. But sadly, we have converted the freedom to worship guaranteed in our Constitution to a freedom not to worship at all. In Ezekiel's day, most of the people had stopped thinking about Yahweh. Thank God Yahweh hadn't stopped thinking about them. Therefore say, this is what the Lord God says. Though I sent them far away from among the nations and scattered them among the countries, yet for a little while I have been a sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone. Therefore say, this is what the Lord God says, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you from the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. I will gather your peoples, God said, speaking through the prophet, of course. He would assemble them from the countries where you have been scattered. And God made one other promise that must have thrilled the soul of Ezekiel when he heard it. He said, and I will give you the land of Israel. He would bring them home. The land had been promised to Abraham some 15 centuries earlier. God instructed the prophet Ezekiel to tell the people the one thing that might galvanize them and cause them to turn back to him and unite as a nation once again. He would bring his people home. Our home, the true home of any Christian, is the promised land of eternal life in heaven. Believers today can find hope in the promise of God's salvation. God is our Father. Heaven is our home. And every day we are one day closer to going home. Perhaps you've drifted away from God. It's an easy thing to do. We all get caught up in things. Work and family and even our friends can at times pull us away from the most important thing. That is worshiping and serving the Lord. Maybe you even allowed some sin to come between you and God. Nothing separates you from God faster than sin. The good news is this, God has not forgotten you. The message is the same today as it was in Ezekiel's day. Repent, turn back to God, God loves you. Yea, I've loved thee with an everlasting love, he told us. Jesus himself assured us that we can turn back to him. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Just as God promised to gather his people in Ezekiel's day, he has promised to restore us to his fellowship. Heaven becomes ours the very moment we turn to Jesus and ask to be forgiven. What a blessing. What a relief. But there's more and I will give them one heart and put a new spirit within them. I will remove their heart of stone from their bodies and give them a heart of flesh so that they may follow my statutes, keep my ordinances, and practice them. Then they will be my people, and I will be their God. God's ultimate purpose has never changed. He desires a relationship with the people he created. They will be my people, he says, and I will be their God. Just as he desired a relationship with the Israelites so long ago, God desires a relationship with you right now. Repent of your sins, invite Jesus Christ into your world in a new way, and discover love. It's easy to do. In your own words, just tell God you need him. Ask for forgiveness of the things you've done wrong, or, or at least the things you know that you failed to do right. And then invite Jesus Christ to come into your heart. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and fellowship with him and he with me. I'm Rich Musler, and thank you for studying God's Word with me today. Because when we study God's Word, we study Christ Jesus. And I'm always up for that. Lord willing, I'll see you next week.